Thanks so much. Uh, let's see if I can get this going. All right. So I guess it was in the first week or so of December 2011 that President Obama stepped up to the uh, podium in a high school in Osawatomi, uh, Kansas, to give a speech called, if I remember correctly, uh, Remarks by the President on the Economy in Osawatomi, uh, Kansas. And in that speech, he called, uh, and as you are calling uh, here, inequality the defining issue of our time. Right? And I sort of wonder why might we be concerned about inequality? And it seems, if you look at least the economics literature, there are three reasons, uh, not just the economics literature. Um, one is we might cons be concerned about inherent fairness in our society, and the fact that so few have uh, so much, and that might confront our, our moral sensibility. The second reason might be because we're concerned about how the economy works, uh, about its efficiency and its stability. And you've also seen economists make that case that economies that have a high degree of inequality are less efficient, uh, are more unstable, and that a high degree of inequality was one of the um, background causes of the financial uh, crisis in a way. And a third reason, which began to play out increasingly in the public policy uh, community after the president's speech is that inequality in some way uh, influences opportunities and rubs up against the, you know, what we often call the American dream, the opportunity be to become all that you can be regardless of your socioeconomic uh, background. So inequality somehow uh, makes equality of opportunity less likely. And that's the third reason, uh, that third reason is what I'd like to focus on today in, in my talk. And so to appreciate uh, the major theme of, of my discussion, I think you have to learn or know a little bit about my tastes in music. So what I'd like to, to do is show you a picture of one of my heroes. I don't know how many people in the room recognize this fellow. Uh, but that's Leonard Cohen, and Leonard Cohen was a, uh, a folk singer who um, sort of started his career in the 1960s in the era of Bob Dylan, uh, Patti Smith, and all those guys uh, around the Chelsea Hotel in, 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 in New York. And he became, went on to become a very, uh, in some circles, uh, popular uh, and successful global uh, star. And I'm quoting here from one of his songs. Uh, I don't want to read it to you because I'd be tempted to start singing. And then I don't think that'd be good for anybody in this room. <laughs> but uh, the last few lines are sort of interesting. Uh, the poor stay poor, the rich get rich. That's how it goes, everybody knows. Okay? And it's certainly true for Leonard Cohen. If you know anything about Leonard Cohen, he's from uh, Montreal. Um, and the geography of Montreal is dominated by this mountain in the middle of the city. And of course, the relatively well-do live on top of the mountain. And Leonard Cohen's family uh, was one amongst those families. So this is a person who was very successful, but he started at the top. And very rarely do people born on mountains fall down. Okay? My other favorite musician is this woman. Um, and again, maybe some of you in the, room don't, in the room haven't seen her before, but that's Shania Twain. And she's a very popular, at least was, uh, a very popular uh, country and western singer who got her start in uh, Nashville. And right now she's, I think, she's playing in Las Vegas. So if you go to Caesars, you can probably see Shania, Shania Twain at some point. But in the 1990s, Shania Twain became um, one of the most popular singers in the entire world. So in, that, in those days, we had CDs, and her CDs uh, were the top-selling CDs of history, okay? Now, Shania Twain actually lived her life in, or started her life in very different circumstances than Leonard Cohen. Uh, she was actually uh, born in, in my home province in, in, in northern Ontario, and raised by a family uh, 
uh, that moved around a lot. She at one point in her biography talks about living in homes with, uh, in the basement of homes with dirt floors. Uh, her stepfather was an Aboriginal uh, person. And um, yeah, I think it's somewhat generous to say that these were straightened circumstances in which this woman lived. She now owns a house in Geneva, another one in New Zealand and countless others, uh, and is an example of someone who started at the very bottom of the economic rungs and rose to the very top, not just in Canada or in the United States, but globally, right? So you have here two success stories with very different starting points. And my discussion is about the capacity of people to move up and uh, down the income distribution uh, uh, according to their family uh, uh, background. And I wanna motivate the talk with three facts and three questions that uh, arise from those facts. The first is that this degree of stickiness across the generations, what I'll call generational earnings mobility, varies a good deal across the countries. So in this graph, I'm giving you one very popular uh, measure of the degree to which your earnings as an adult are related to your parents' earnings. So if you, figure, if you see a figure of uh, something like 0.5 or so in this graph, what that means is if your parents made twice as much as my parents, 100% more than my parents, well then you as an adult will end up making 50% more than me, okay? That's a substantial difference between the two of us. So in some societies, uh, that stickiness is that high, okay? In other societies, it's much weaker. In uh, Finland, Norway, and Denmark, it's less than a fifth. So that even though there is a tie between your income as an adult and your parents' income, it, that stickiness will dissipate after another generation. There won't be any tie between your income and your grandparents' income, okay? Whereas in the United Kingdom, Italy, and the United States, that, uh, that stickiness will echo across at least two or three generations. So one reason that uh, inequality has been at the top of the public policy discussion, and I don't think I'm exaggerating too much by saying it's at the top, is that in some sense, it's a bit of a surprise to see the United States at this end. Uh, of, of this distribution. A country in which the American dream suggests that uh, you can become all that you can be regardless of your parents' uh, uh, background, okay? Now, if generational uh, uh, earnings mobility varies, we still have an important public policy question. Does this really require, require a policy intervention of some sort? The second fact and the second motivating question has to do with the fact that mobility varies, but it varies in a particular way. So along the vertical dimension of this graph, I've organized our stickiness indicator, what economists call the intergenerational earnings elasticity, from the most mobile societies to the least mobile societies. And then along the horizontal axis, I've ranked countries according to a popular measure of inequality. So the most equal societies are over here, and the most unequal societies are to the extreme uh, uh, right when you're looking horizontally. All right. What this suggests is that as income inequality at a point in time is higher, and this is about a generation ago, about 1985, the degree of mobility is lower, all right? So societies that are highly unequal also tend to be societies in which there isn't a good deal of mobility. More equal societies have more mobility across the intergenerational earnings uh, distribution. And uh, this relationship uh, was called by one of um, uh, President Obama's uh, senior economic advisors, uh, Alan Kruger, the Great Gatsby Curve. 
Now, the more statistically significant am amongst you might wonder why a straight line is called a curve. Um, but I suggest you talk to the White House about that. <laughs> uh, so I didn't give it this name, but I, I, I did, along with others, sort of put this data together from which the White House uh, took this graph. But it is just a relationship, and it seems to me it's really important, if you're interested in public policy, to understand the underlying causes. If inequality, in monetary terms, influences mobility directly, then it seems to me, for public policy purposes, you have a very uh, easy agenda. You can tax and transfer in the here and now, reduce inequality uh, in the present, and it'll promote more mobility. Okay? But that requires a certain underlying uh, theory. So I think to explore these policy issues, we have to become familiar with some of the important elements of theory. And I'm going to argue that the link between inequality and mobility is mediated by a whole series of institutions um, that determine the structure of opportunity in a society. And it's through those institutions that inequality has its influence some of it, uh, as those institutions are certainly monetary and some are, are non-monetary, all right? But we have to understand those underlying causes. And that's the second question I'd like to address uh, in the talk today. Finally, I want to underscore uh, a very important fact that was alluded to earlier in this conference, that inequality is uh, on the rise in most countries. And I've taken this chart from a very important study by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And uh, what this Paris-based think tank for the rich countries did was group countries according to their starting point uh, in terms of inequality. That's what these bars are. Uh, and the end point. So if you see an upward arrow here, it means between 1985 and 2008, inequality has been increasing, all right? And for the majority of countries, that in fact is the case. It's only in a few countries that it stayed the same or fallen a little bit. But almost everywhere, inequality has gone up. And in large part, this is due, well, not in large part, but to some measure, this is due because top incomes have increased. So here's a similar chart referring to the share of incomes going to the top 1%. So in the United States in, um, in 1990, the top 1% earned about 13% of all the money in the economy that year. But uh, uh, about 20 years later, that rose to 18, almost 19%, okay? So, um, that raises my third uh, question. If we are seeing over the last two, three decades higher inequality, will that mean that those societies will also experience less social mobility, okay? Less intergenerational mobility, all right? So that's how I've uh, structured uh, this talk and uh, I'm certainly Looking forward to questions uh, afterwards. Uh, so prepare them as we go along, because if you don't, I'd be happy to start singing some Shania Twain for you. And neither of us, as I suggested, wants that. <laughs> so I, the first thing I want to say, I mean, uh, statistics are, are very important. They give us a lens onto a very foggy uh, world. but. No one measure is going to be perfect or capture all dimensions uh, of uh, reality. And the statistic I've been using, the intergenerational earnings uh, mobility, is um, a marker of equality of opportunity. Uh, it might be signaling uh, inequality of opportunity, but it's, and I caution you, not a direct measure of equality of opportunity. Okay, it's the gradient between the adult uh, earnings of a child and his or her parents and expressed entirely in percentage terms. So it's about relative mobility. Okay. So the statistics I presented to you are about the position in the income distribution that I occupy compared 
to the position in the income distribution my parents occupied. Okay? That's saying nothing about absolute uh, measures of well-being. It's not saying whether my parents, in some absolute sense, are better off than I am, whether I will be able to afford the same type of lifestyle, uh, buy a house, etc. cetera, uh, in, in that sense. The cross-country comparisons uh, I've offered you, I've tried to maximize the number of countries that I can include, and therefore I've had to focus in on studies that um, just address the relationship between fathers and sons. Obviously, um, uh, putting mothers and daughters uh, into this is very important, um, but it, it doesn't really make much difference in the countries in which uh, I'm able to get evidence for uh, mothers and daughters, in per part because a generation or two, two ago, uh, family income was dominated by the income of the, uh, the male partner uh, in the household. Obviously, as we update these studies uh, in our times, we have to be much more comprehensive, and more and more studies are being more cautious in that, in that sense. So a couple of cautions about the statistics. Uh, the other caution, as I suggested, is that this is not a direct measure of equality of opportunity. And philosophers uh, tell us, and particularly here I'm relying on the work of John Romer, who's been very clear on this. He teaches uh, philosophy and economics at, at Yale. Equality of opportunity, in Romer's terms, means that inequities of outcome are not defensible when they are the result of different circumstances. So the catchword here is circumstances. And what Romer is trying to do is draw a line between the outcomes for which you should in some sense be responsible, the outcomes that reflect individual choice and individual efforts, and the outcomes for which, in some sense, you aren't responsible for, that reflect things beyond your control, and that, in some sense, um, you should be compensated for, okay? Um, we are not responsible for our parents' education levels, and yet, having more educated parents gives us a boost in life, all right? Um, that's the kind of thing he's talking about. And that's what he means by circumstances. Now, obviously, where you draw that line is going to be a value uh, judgment. And he suggests that most citizens would probably agree with the idea that social connections uh, associated with family income or with networks shouldn't determine, in a society characterized by equality of opportunity, access to health care, to education, and even to particular jobs. If we live in a society that's governed by nepotism, most people would probably agree that that's a circumstance that would not be consistent with equality of opportunity, okay? And he has this sort of series of four different circumstances, and we could imagine societies drawing the line between circumstance uh, and effort in different ways. And he admits that ch children resemble their parents for all sorts of reasons, uh, genetic being one of them. If height or beauty, eye color, hair color are transmitted genetically uh, across the generations, and if labor markets continue to value those types of characteristics, if the more beautiful earn more, if taller people earn more, then we shouldn't be surprised that there's an also a link between the earnings of parents uh, and, their, and their children, okay? And there's nothing we can do about that, so we may want to compensate people for that. On the other hand, parents also instill values in their children. They form their preferences, their aspirations, and motivation. And there's a very gray area between uh, these influences. And if the family and family culture is still an important part of how we raise children, uh, 
then maybe we were going to also permit in a society otherwise characterized by equality of opportunity the transmission of those family values. I mean, that is after all why, why many people have children, to transmit their uh, values, okay? So uh, these, this intergenerational link is something that we can't always do something about and to some degree, we don't want to do something about in our societies, okay? Uh, and so it's going to require a certain amount of philosophy and an inherent value judgment to define what equality of opportunity is, all right? So that's a very important caution that uh, one of the goals for policy should not be to eliminate entirely the intergenerational uh, relationship between parent and child's uh, earnings. And as I just showed you, showed you, in the most mobile countries, in Denmark, in Finland, and in Norway, there is still a stickiness between earnings. Okay. Uh, so this is what, what this slide is about, that our goal for public policy shouldn't be a perfectly flat uh, parent-child uh, gradient. I'm just going to assert to save time that uh, that said, uh, more mobility is a good thing. And there's a, a, a little bit of evidence to suggest that societies that are more intergenerationally mobile also have uh, higher reported levels of, of life satisfaction. So in some sense, perhaps, uh, the degree of stickiness in the United States should be something we should be concerned about. Um, let me move on to the underlying determinants of social mobility. And this is where I really want to offer you a framework to think about these issues, a framework that flows from an understanding of economic uh, theory. There are a number of complementary or interacting influences on the degree of social mobility. But the first is the nature of public policy, okay? And public policy is a social choice determining a social mobility. And what falls out of some of um, the um, models that economists have used is the idea that public policies that are of relatively more advantage to the disadvantage promote mobility. So public policies that level the playing field uh, in the determination of an individual's uh, human capital are going to promote a mobility either up or down in the income distribution. They do that in a number of ways. Um, the most basic and fundamental concern of the welfare state is to provide insurance by buffering families from income and, uh, and, and, and other shocks. So if we can stabilize family incomes, stabilize the resources that children have as they grow up, that is a good thing for mobility. The other thing that the welfare state does is invest directly in the human capital of uh, children. So human capital are all those attributes of an individual that influence his or her earnings capacity but that are also subject to choice, to incentives, okay? Think primarily of education, but also healthcare, uh, migration are also important aspects of human capital. But the touchstone is your schooling and your skills, um, perhaps certainly some aspects of personality as well. But public policy, as I suggested, is a choice and it can be designed in different ways. Public policies that are relatively more advantaged to the already advantaged will reinforce inequalities coming from the labor market and uh, these societies will be more unequal and they will be less socially mobile, okay? Public policy matters, but uh, it can be designed in very different ways. And it interacts with other fundamental institutions. We've already spoken about the prime role of the family in determining a child's uh, outcomes. And families that invest more, in, more human capital in their children will promote uh, that child's earnings in the long run, okay? 
Um, the other thing that's important here is the capacity of families to make that investment in the sense of not just the monetary resources they have, but also the time. So families uh, uh, with more children, uh, and I mean this sort of in a per capita sense, uh, invest less in each child. So think of a single child being raised by two parents versus a single child being raised by a teenage mom, okay? In one family, there are bo both more monetary and more non-monetary resources to invest in that child. So the thinner you spread those resources, the less human capital the child has. Family structure matters, and families that are already highly educated and therefore have a higher income will devote more to investing uh, in the child, okay? So the family, it seems to me, is the central institution determining uh, social mobility. But families interact with the labor market, okay? And the labor market determines not just monetary resources, but how much time they have left over to spend with their kids. Anything that increases the cost of human capital, um, to the extent that the education system is much more market-driven so that tuition fees are higher and higher, for example, anything that increases that cost uh, will tend to see less human capital being invested in children. So if a child in a less rich country has to walk five or ten miles to get to school, uh, has to buy a uniform in order to participate in schooling, that will mean less education and less human capital. All right? The other thing that's really important and that I want to focus on is the return to human capital. And the return to human capital is a marker for the degree of inequality in the labor market. So the US labor market is characterized, or at least uh, was until recently, by a very high returns to schooling. Every extra year of schooling got you a, a real punch in your income in, in the US. And that was one of the reasons that inequality increased so much since the late 70s, the higher return to human capital. So that's going to do a couple of things. It's going to change the resources available to families. Well-educated, highly skilled families are now going to be making a lot more than they did as well. But it's also going to change their incentives. They know that the name of the game is uh, schooling and they are going to shift their investments and do everything they can to be certain that their kids get on the right track to the best uh, colleges, okay? So both resources and incentives are going to change as the return to human capital changes. And if that isn't, um, uh, this is sort of one of the way, main ways that labor market inequality shadows itself into the family. And finally, as I alluded to, the state is the third institution. It can step in here and buffer families, uh, especially less advantaged families, or it can exacerbate uh, market inequalities depending upon its, how it's designed. Uh, is schooling going to be a public uh, good and freely accessible as it is in some uh, uh, economies? Uh, or is it going to be a very segmented uh, private system in which the amount of funding that goes into primary and secondary school is determined by property values in a very small uh, uh, area. These are all open to social choice, how the state functions. Is there going to be a, a really robust system of insurance through unemployment insurance or other supports that puts us a, a lower floor on family incomes? Is there going to be support for daycare and other uh, types of investment in kids that uh, reduce time stress in, 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 in uh, households. Mm, the state has a role to play in this. And so to understand this theory, you have to appreciate that there's no one button or no one lever that a policymaker gets to pull to change social mobility. There's a whole host of determinants and they all uh, in interact, okay? Let me begin to sort of parse out in a stylized way some of these underlying factors and how they help us to explain the differences 
uh, that are depicted by the Great Gatsby curve. What I've done here, in the usual way, we have our marker of intergenerational stickiness. Uh, the, the most mobile societies, Norway and Denmark, are down here. And the least mobile societies, Italy, the United Kingdom, and the United States, are ranked high. So as you move up here, mobility, intergenerational mobility decreases. But this time on the axis, I've put a sort of rough and ready uh, marker of the returns to human capital, the returns to schooling. This is the amount of money a college-educated person makes above and beyond someone with a high school diploma, expressed as a ratio. So if you see 100 here, it means if uh, someone with a college degree makes $100, someone with a high school diploma also makes $100, okay? If you see 180, it means uh, for every $100 that the high school uh, grad makes, the college grad makes $180. Mm -hmm. So the return to education increases as, as we move out along this axis. And so you can see again, our countries are sort of organized with a positive tendency. Uh, the outliers sort of tell us something interesting. In Italy, the return to education is very low, all right? In Italy, basically, I think Antonio will correct me if I'm, if, if I'm, I'm wrong. We just had a, a short chat about this. Um, it doesn't cost anything or not much to go to university. And a lot of people spend a lot of time in university. Uh, it becomes sort of a, 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 a consumption good. But you don't get uh, a big bang for uh, each year you spent in schooling. Something else is going on in Italy that is determining this high degree of stickiness. That's a bit of pu a puzzle. Whereas in the United States, uh, the return to education is the highest amongst the countries I've listed here, okay? And that's strongly associated with the degree of mobility, all right? So that's how labor market inequality gets into the family, all right, in the US. It's the returns, the schooling that really matters and I'm going to argue that's changed resources and in, in incentives. So if you're a policymaker, then you also have to think about what determines the demand for skilled and highly trained people, what determines the supply? Because that's ultimately what's gonna determine this return to education. And so why was my country, uh, Canada, uh, um, able in this world in which there have been all kinds of technological changes that have increased the returns, the, the demand for highly skilled people, able to see its supply of highly skilled people keep up with the demand uh, and mute the returns to, uh, to schooling. Whereas in other societies like the American, that wasn't the case. It probably has something to do with the structure of the schooling system and access to good quality schooling, okay? So we're naturally asked then, who is able to make uh, the, these kinds of investments? Here in this graph, I've taken a usual measure. Again, uh, more mobility uh, countries ranked at the bottom, high mobility countries at the top. And here's a different sort of gradient. It's the gradient between the number of years of schooling your parents have and the number of years of schooling the next generation ends up getting. So this says for every extra year of education of the parents, uh, in some societies, the child gets two-fifths of an extra year, all the way up to about uh, six-tenths. So this is a marker of how education is transmitted across the generations, okay? So um, in Denmark, uh, Norway, Finland, if your parents are university graduates, mm, the chances uh, are that, uh, if your parents are not university graduates, that doesn't really say a lot about your chances of becoming a university grad, okay? Whereas in the United Kingdom, if you have university educated parents, it's almost certain that you will not drop out of high school, all right? There is a good deal of stickiness in the transmission of education across the generations. And in the UK, in that society, its position on the Great Gatsby Curve is very much determined 
by that kind of influence. All right? And in the US, that plays a, 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 a role as well, sort of a, 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 a middling role. All right? So uh, if families are well endowed uh, monetarily, and if families are well endowed in terms of human capital, in terms of the actual skill set, those two things also go together. Children are going to get a much better start in some societies uh, than, in, than in others. Let me move now to uh, a discussion uh, of the family. If that's the labor market and some aspects of, uh, of the education system, um, what I've done here with uh, US data, I've divided, my co-authors and I, have actually um, divided the uh, sample in this data set into two, uh, to three groups. Uh, people, or 14-year-olds, rather, who came from households in which the level of uh, parental education is very high, that's to say at least one parent has a college degree, uh, versus uh, families in which parents have low education, no more than a, a high school uh, diploma, and then everyone else is in the middle. And these are some fundamental math skills, multiplication and division, placing value, um, being able to master rates and measurement, uh, that we might expect 14-year-olds to have, and that are in fact are highly correlated with uh, uh, labor market earnings uh, in adulthood. And you can see a very sharp gradient developing in these, uh, these basic skills. Okay, so if you, um, if you come from a family in which the highest level of education is a high school diploma amongst the parents, only 50% of those kids have mastered skills around rates and measurement, okay? Whereas if your parents have a college degree, uh, over 80% have, all right? So your parents help you out in a lot of ways, okay? Not just monetarily, they're taking care of your schooling and your success in schooling in very concrete ways. And so these gradients start appearing in high school. And in fact, I can show you similar charts uh, at the age of five or so, okay? Now obviously, we're gonna give five-year-olds different sorts of tests to assess their math and, 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 and reading skills, uh, and those tests are age appropriate but you see a very sharp gradient across parental education backgrounds, okay? So Romer might think of these as some of the circumstances that, uh, that you're living uh, uh, under. I'm going to suggest that um, money matters, and uh, I've placed in this uh, graph uh, Canadian children in the American income distribution, and I've placed American children in the American income distribution. I've broken that distribution uh, into 10 equal parts, from the bottom 10th to the top 10th, and, and for the society as a whole, 10% of the population would be in each of those 10 parts, but we're looking only at uh, families with children. So children, tend to be in families that are not as, um, that don't have as much income as the entire American population. But what's very clear from this, American children are much more likely to be uh, in the higher income parts of the income distribution than Canadian children, okay? At the same time, when you are in the very bottom, okay, it's much less likely that a Canadian child would fall in the bottom 10% of the American in income distribution than an, a typical American child, okay? So the level of absolute poverty amongst American children is much lower than in Canada, okay? Most Canadian children, if you place them in the American income distribution, would be lower middle income kids, all right? All right? So this degree of uh, inequality in family structure, all right, for kids matters, all right? Money matters. And that's one of the things that is influencing the differences between those two countries. Let's look at the relatively advantaged American households. Uh, about 
I guess not last uh, spring, but the spring before, just as the new graduates were hitting the labor market, an enterprising reporter from Forbes asked, uh, this new crop of graduates, what are the uh, 10 most likely jobs that they will get that did not exist 10 years ago, all right? So if you were a new grad in uh, 2012, you're hitting a kind of labor market with new jobs that a decade ago grads just didn't have access to. And there are some that we would have sort of guessed. A very popular job for new graduates was uh, being an app developer, being a market research data miner, or a social media manager. They were amongst the most popular jobs for new grads that did not exist 10 years ago. But my eye, when I read this article, fell on something called an educational or admissions consultant. And the reporter described the, uh, the job that uh, was very popular now but did not exist 10 years ago this way. When a certain set of affluent parents watch their toddler stack his or her first set of blocks, they're not lost in the moment of cute. They're strategizing their child's likeliness of getting into the right preschool. These moms and dads will stop at nothing to secure the best education for their kids, which for many includes hiring an educational or admissions consultant to help ease the process of interviewing and testing into schools from preschool to college. Admissions consultants can be paid thousands of dollars for their skills, which often include personal connections with school administrators, all right? So <laughs> the gateway to admissions to an Ivy League school for some families starts with getting into the right pre-kindergarten, all right? And obviously that's a bit of an anecdote, but you can see these kinds of expenditures rising in very significant ways during this era of higher and higher inequality. I'm borrowing from a paper here by uh, Greg uh, Duncan and Dick Murnane, Mer which was published a couple years ago. And they are charting something they call enrichment expenditures. All of those extras that uh, outside of the schooling system promote a child's capacities, his or her human capital. And enrichment expenditures for people in the bottom 20% of the income distribution have risen over the last uh, 30 decades or so from an average of about $835 uh, to uh, over $1,300. That's a significant increase, uh, about 50%. But in the top 20%, they have just ballooned. And the gap between children being raised in the top 20% and the bottom 20%, okay, has just become a yawning gap. And this is what I meant earlier about all of these other resources mattering uh, and mattering more in an era of higher uh, in inequality. Money matters, uh, but also connections to jobs matter. This is a graph in two relatively mobile countries of the chances that a young uh, adult, a young male adult, someone in his 30s, will at some point have worked for the very same employer that his father had worked for at some point. And for Canada, that's about four in 10, which I thought was relatively high. Four in 10 young Canadian men will have had a job over, from the ages of about 15 to 30, at an employer that had also employed their father. But if that's the average for sons in the top 1%, it's seven out of 10, all right? And recently, the Census Bureau re released uh, some studies like this for the United States. It's, um, the groupings are for each 10%, uh, uh, each decile of the income distribution. And those results are sort of consistent with these findings. So in some, some, some broad way, you should think of networks or connections mattering as well. I've shown you here a very extreme connection. It's not uh, n uh, uh, network mattering, access to particular jobs with particular employers, but you should think of that more broadly 
uh, access to particular colleges uh, uh, a, 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 as well. For the relatively disadvantaged, the story is a, is a bit different, um, but I think for the sake of time, uh, you can fill in those gaps and I'll pass over this. So let me move to my three um, major conclusions. I've posed three questions, three questions I think that help you structure a discussion of inequality and equality of opportunity. Uh, and the first question had to do with um, um, social mobility varying. Uh, and I'm suggesting that it varies across the rich countries in statistically identifiable ways and that this variation should be a public policy concern. But that concern can't proceed to policy without having an appreciation of the underlying uh, causes that requires us to use some theory. It varies, the degree of social mobility varies with inequality, but inequality measured in monetary terms should not be thought of as the sole cause. It's a signal of a whole set of forces associated with family, associated with the labor market, and associated with the, uh, the state. And finally, I've tried to suggest um, somewhat briefly that in an era of growing inequality, more unequal societies are likely to phrase it cautiously, to not experience more mobility without conservative and effective public policies. And it seems to me that's why I think inequality is one of the defining issues of our time. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed reading the paper tremendously, uh, and I enjoyed the presentation. And I must tell you that I understand, having read the paper, why it got the prize from the Canadian Economic Association. Uh, it really is an excellent paper, and it is accessible, um, even for people who have not had uh, many courses in econometrics. Um, so I recommend it. Uh, let me also say that um, I have no uh, qualms whatsoever with the findings in the paper. They um, make a lot of sense to me empirically and they make a lot of sense to me theoretically in terms of reasoning out uh, the processes at work that uh, Professor Korak uh, described. Um, the, the major points are uh, that there is a relationship between income inequality and social stickiness, lack of um, social mobility, and uh, that the way that works, that's the really nice part of the paper, is a careful tracing out of the transmission mechanism uh, that takes you from income inequality to lack of social uh, mobility. And a lot of that has to do with education. Uh, and that's all traced out uh, very carefully in the paper, and it is uh, convincing. Um, in that context, uh, I find it very interesting. I don't know that Professor Korak uh, talked about that, but there's a part of the paper uh, where he shows that um, the major uh, ways in which inequality in income uh, gets uh, translated into inequalities of opportunities is uh, not in the middle ranges of the distribution of income as much, but at the top and at the bottom. There is something there that still works for the middle class, if you will, uh, but that the people uh, at the top um, kind of are able to provide their children with lots of advantages and opportunities that fit in uh, with the way in which our society has gone about distributing income, and that is through education, through human capital, private uh, human capital, if you will. Uh, and uh, that the people at the bottom just do not have the resources with which to provide their children with a set of opportunities that would allow them to be successful. 
I think that's documented in a way that I had not seen before, uh, and I appreciated that documentation, and I find it uh, persuasive. Um, there is one, uh, uh, something else in the paper that Professor Karak also uh, didn't mention or it escaped me, um, and that is that the paper hands, if you read it, uh, with uh, a sense of pessimism, actually, about whether we will be able to reverse these trends through the use of public policy, or at least that's how I read that. And the basic idea there is that since more and more income has been going to the top 1% or the top 10%, I think the 1% is overdone, it's more likely the top 10% that have political uh, influence. Uh, and, and since that's where a lot of political power lies, unfortunately, with money and, and influence, it is unlikely that the people at the top are going to be supporting public policies that will increase opportunities for people at the bottom. I think there is evidence that the dynamics of our political process are not working to increase equality of opportunities. Uh, there is certainly a sense of the need to do that, and there are certainly people who are trying to do that, but the political climate for that um, is not been a very favorable one, and it's unlikely to become uh, uh, more favorable in the future. I think that's important for how we think about what we can do about this, if we want to do something about this, if we want to reverse those trends. So, um, uh, what can I say here? And I, I think I would like to make two sorts of comments. One is about the local situation, um, uh, just because um, uh, Professor Smith said that I kind of had done some research on the local economy, which is true, and I feel compelled to say a little bit about that. I don't know how many of you here are from Lancaster County. How many of you, can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's, that's a, a large uh, not enough number of people uh, to make this relevant. Uh, the picture in Lancaster County is one that uh, in some ways doesn't fit the larger picture that Professor Korak uh, painted, but in some ways it does fit it. And I'll just tell you the ways in which it fits and it doesn't fit, and you can draw your uh, conclusions from that. Uh, Lancaster County has got one of the uh, more equally uh, divided incomes. Um, the level of income uh, inequality here is, is relatively low, relatively low. Uh, we are uh, the third uh, most uh, equal in terms of the distribution of income county in the United States. There was a story recently in the local papers uh, about that. Uh, I don't know how that compares, and I didn't have the time, and I didn't even think about it until right now, how that compares with what the level of um, the Gini coefficient would be in, in Canadian uh, areas. Uh, but relative to the U.S., Lancaster County has a, a fairly equal distribution of income. Um, so income is more equally divided up here uh, amongst households. Uh, but educational uh, attainment, which is, has something to do with you know, educational opportunities, uh, tends to be very low here relative to other areas. So it's not the case, it's not playing itself out here uh, that um, higher degrees of equality are correlated with uh, greater access to higher levels of education. That's where we fall uh, short. Uh, I think the reasons for that uh, are larger structural forces at work in the economy. Uh, wage rates tend to be lower here in Lancaster County than they are in other areas as well. Uh, and by the way, uh, that's because of the types of jobs that we have here. It's a strong manufacturing base, relatively speaking. Uh, and uh, the uh, lower wages and not just incomes, but lower wage rates, wage levels uh, that uh, are available here. And this is for uh, people doing the same type of work. Uh, 
They tend to get paid a little bit less here than elsewhere. It's not that we just have a concentration of uh, lower wage jobs here. Same types of jobs elsewhere in the state on the average pay more than they do in Lancaster County. Um, and um, what that has given rise to is a lot of um, employers moving to this area and cultivating and developing businesses in this area. They are the type of uh, employers who are attracted by a lower wage labor force. People who don't ask to be paid a lot of money and people who don't have a strong union, for example, movement so that wages here tend to be lower. And uh, uh, people have tended to um, kind of get jobs uh, because there have been plenty of jobs available uh, in, in the economy in Lancaster County, very low unemployment rate. People have made a living here on the basis of working long hours for lower wages. Employers have gotten accustomed to um, kind of uh, having lower wage workers available to them. And so nobody has really been promoting education here. And uh, in fact, educational attainments here are lower than uh, they are elsewhere. Uh, it's funny uh, because in some ways that keeps back the potential for economic development in this area. I got a call once from uh, a consultant who was doing uh, work for a company that wanted to sell some land in order to provide you know, uh, housing for upper income levels people to attract them to Lancaster County. And they weren't sure that they were going to recommend that type of a project because not enough people here just go to college, not as much as elsewhere. Um, so that's just to give you a little sense of how all of these issues, relationships between income, education, and the larger structure of the economy plays itself out here in Lancaster County. Go and make of that whatever you would like to make of that. Uh, uh, getting back, though, to the major point of Professor Corrick's paper, uh, which had nothing to do with Lancaster County, but much larger forces at work. Um, what I'd like to add about that, um, and remember uh, all of the things that I said before about how strong the paper is, looking at education, looking at how there is a connection between family income and the ability of uh, children from those families to access good quality education and therefore develop their human capital uh, uh, through the uh, private you know, uh, mechanisms. Human capital is a private concept. Um, I, I'd like to um, uh, suggest and also feeding off uh, the idea that uh, it is unlikely now that we are going to be getting the wealthy, the elite, higher income people to support public you know, uh, programs of providing a kind of assistance for lower income people to go to college. Um, and colleges know about this, by the way. They know that they need to provide scholarships, you know, but that's kind of a very difficult thing to achieve. Uh, and even if you provide scholarships, uh, to people. Um, it requires a certain amount of social skills for people who come from lower income families to be able to access those uh, scholarships. Uh, so that's just one part of the puzzle. Uh, and, and, and so the, the, the difficulty, right, uh, of moving from lower income level families, right, to educational opportunities remain there. They're not they're not difficulties, right, that can be removed just simply by making more money available like that. It requires a, a larger kind of reconstitution of the way in which, you know, um, education is structured in the country uh, and in the ways uh, in which uh, income is generated in the country. And I'd like simply to suggest um, that perhaps uh, what we ought to be doing if we are concerned about these rising inequalities is um, that we get really behind uh, some uh, uh, political initiatives not to uh, provide more scholarships to people or not to uh, generate uh, kind of uh, more income 
right, for people to have access to in order to go to school. But let's make the public, let's make schools, let's make higher education more universally accessible, not through the private market, but make it free. Um, free public higher education. Uh, I went to school uh, in New York City when in fact tuition was free. It cost me $70 a semester uh, to go to college. It's unusual in the United States, uh, but going down that path uh, will make access uh, to a public higher, to higher education available to people on a different basis um, because money then is not an issue. Uh, social connections to tie you with scholarships are not an issue. The message goes out uh, to people that uh, higher education is a public good, right, that is just made available to people without them necessarily having developed the proper social connections. That would be one way of going about it, uh, trying to uh, provide the type of public policy that changes what the nature of education is from a private good to a public uh, good. I think if we can do that, I think we will have a chance. I don't want to underplay the uh, political difficulties of pulling that off, uh, but it seems to me that to call for making uh, education a public good uh, and not a privately negotiated good uh, and not a privately negotiated good even with public money, but just a public good would go a long way towards changing the way right, we think education works in the society uh, and the way in which we communicate expectations to children from whatever level of income uh, that they have, that in fact, you know, this is a public good available to them, just like high school is a public good available to them. Uh, that begins to change the way in which the people at the bottom see what the opportunities, the world of opportunities is uh, for them. I think that that's very important. Uh, the other uh, way in which I would also like to suggest we can go about this um, is, and those are complementary, uh, is that we need to be paying attention right, to the sources that create the inequalities uh, to begin with. Uh, the forces of globalization that have in fact created uh, increasing levels of inequalities in all of the countries, and Professor Korak kind of uh, illustrated in one of his graphs, this is a, a worldwide phenomenon, this increase in inequalities. Um, uh, and now, one of the, the dominant um, ideas out there about why there is more inequality uh, have to do with uh, this question of education. Education just, you know, has uh, yielded more and more of a premium. Uh, and so as the labor force has had to become more educated, more productive through higher levels of education, and people haven't kept up with that, right? That, that has generated uh, increasing levels of income inequality. So um, increasing levels of inequality at the point of educational opportunities have become seen as the cause of increasing levels of inequalities in the distribution of income. Um, and that's the way it has played itself out, although not everywhere. In the United States more so, not so much in Canada, not so much in other countries. It's very important to realize that in fact you know, it hasn't had to go uh, the way it has gone in the United States. It doesn't have to go that way. In other places, it hasn't gone that way. I like to suggest that there is a set of other forces now at work uh, that um, have allowed uh, technological and organizational changes to create this high degree of income inequality in the United States which go beyond education, even though the educational process has been part of that. There's other forces uh, that have uh, produced that outcome and that also need to be tackled if we're going to be able to get at this question of equalities of opportunities. Those other forces have to do with the fact that wages haven't kept up in general. If you take a look right, at what's been going on, productivity has been going up and up and up and up again, but wages have not, in real terms, wages have barely moved since the 1970s for people. Um, 
why that has happened? Well, uh, that is a whole other paper, right? Um, it's got to do with the role of labor, it's got to do with the role of unions, it's got to do uh, kind of with the way in which we think about markets and all that kind of stuff. But that is something that really needs to be tackled. And unless that is tackled too, along with whatever other um, kind of policy initiatives uh, we will want to take that deal directly with education, we're going to keep on having the inequalities in the distribution of income that we have been seeing and to provide the equality of opportunities uh, in the face of persisting inequalities in the distribution of income is going to be very, very, very difficult. So I think my take from all of this is, boy, things are really bad and we have a big job and we need to address it from a number of different angles. Uh, sociological angles, anthropological angles, psychological angles, and also in terms of how we structure the relationship between capital and labor uh, in, in the country. So I've gone on for too long because I'm sure you have lots of questions for Professor Korak, and I'll just stop. Baseline and all this, and, and what the baseline seems to me to be is, is absolute poverty. If you look, if you look at relative poverty around the world, but a recent medical, mobile medical study went to Appalachia to offer free medical services. And people came from hundreds of miles around to camp out overnight to get medical treatment. That would not happen in Europe. And if you're if you're if you're consumed with worrying about not providing primary education as a public good for all your children, then you're not going to change it. Thanks for the question. <laughs> uh, I, I should say, so uh, when I focused on education here, it, it, you can think of it as a metaphor for human capital in the, in the large. Uh, and um, that certainly includes health care. And the other thing that we should be careful about, uh, as was just pointed out, is that we're not just talking about uh, access to um, college education. And sometimes a very important determinant of whether someone gets a college degree or not are all the other decisions and all the other investments made that put a 16 or 17 year old in a position in which she or he could legitimately choose to go on to college. And I think in the economics literature, there is in fact a good deal of emphasis on, emphasis on early childhood education and important high quality uh, primary education as, as you quite correctly pointed out as being uh, very important ingredients of, of, of that. idea that, that the labor market is 
I'm not sure I do, but let me try to answer it anyways. <laughs> um, so there are different models of the labor market. I think you can get a good deal of mileage from demand and supply, um, but obviously that can't be the whole story all, all the time. So the question had to do with sort of our attitudes to labor and our valuation of it. And maybe the way I'll, I'll try to answer it, and maybe not the way that you intended it, um, is with our attitudes towards not so much how the labor market functions, but our attitudes to outcomes f uh, from it. So societies differ very much in the attitude that they have towards inequality, and particularly in the discussion around the determination of uh, CEO pay. There are some hypotheses about cultural attitudes changing to, in the United States or in North America, uh, somehow accepting that those in the top one-tenth of one percent or one-hundredth of one percent are paid so much. And that has to do, I think, ultimately those, those values uh, mesh with notions of bargaining power to lead to these outcomes. So in Europe, where I'm thinking, for example, in Germany, the cultural attitudes uh, are very different towards inequality, and therefore what's projected upon what's legitimate for the top one percenters to earn is very different and skews those, uh, changes those outcomes differently. I don't think that's necessarily the way you, you, you meant the question. I can only speak to the topic because that's the, the fraction of the literature and the economics that I'm familiar with. I'm sure there's a lot more discussion about that. Um, societies also differ in um, their sense of the, um, uh, the value of entrepreneurship. Uh, so to exa for example, to cite one example, I was involved in doing a public opinion survey of the American dream and what that means in the United States and what that would mean in Canada. And the countries are remarkably similar in what the American dream means. But there were a couple of differences between the two countries. One was certainly attitude towards government. And uh, so uh, Americans are much more inclined to believe than, Amer uh, than Canadians that the government does more to hinder than to help their pursuit of the good life. That could then reflect on uh, government transfers and government determined parts of the incomes. And the other way in which Americans differed was um, owning and creating a business was much more a part of what the American dream meant in the United States than in Canada. So you could see perhaps people in that sense um, valuing income from capital, from uh, business, more than income from uh, er earnings. But I really can't say the extent to which that actually uh, influences things uh, uh, in, in the large. Right? Um, but certainly tastes, preferences, attitudes are part of that demand and supply model. They reflect the bargaining structure of the model and what's permissible in a society. Um, but probably someone better versed than I could, could answer that question. Unfortunately, I think we have to surrender the room to the, the next, next session. All right. So thanks to our presenters, Dr. Clark and Dr. Clark. Thank you. Thank you.